Hey everybody, welcome to this Light Bearers Bible Study. This is part three of our series on the three angels' messages. Last week, Kessia joined us and we talked about the fear of God. And today we have our friend Elise Harvel with us. And Elise and I are going to talk about what it means to give God glory. Elise is a theology student, a writer, and a nurse, and also one of my best friends. So we're super excited that she's here. And as always, guys, we are going to have time for questions and answers at the end. So feel free throughout the study as they're talking and what they're sharing generates more ideas and thoughts in your head. Feel free uh, to ask questions and you can submit them by clicking. There's a tab, ask a question tab at the bottom middle of your screen. So feel free to submit questions there throughout our time together. And I'm going to hand the time over to you guys after we say a word of prayer. You guys ready, Ty, Elise? Mm -hmm. Let's do it. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you are truly selfless and that you give us um, your word and that we can dive deep into topics that don't always make sense on the surface. I pray that you would guide Elise and Ty as they have this conversation and just open all of our hearts and our minds to what you want to teach us about what it means to truly glorify you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, guys, take it away. Thanks, right. Sally. Well, first of all, I uh, just want to say welcome to everybody, wherever you are in the world. Looking here in the chat, it's just amazing. Uh, some of you have, have uh, indicated where you're from. Uh, it's pretty cool because we have people who join this Bible study each week from all over the country and internationally. And it's, it's an amazing thing. And I'll tell you why I think it's so amazing. There is this idea that uh, emerged out of the Protestant Reformation. It, it actually is a biblical idea, so it predates the Protestant Reformation, but it emerged out of the Protestant Reformation in this language. And, and the language is the priesthood of all believers. And what that means, among other things, is that there is a greater understanding of truth that emerges when various minds cross-pollinate. So, so I'm more likely to understand something more clearly if I see it not only through my eyes alone, but through my eyes combined with seeing the subject through your eyes and your eyes and your eyes. So if you can get two or three people, 10 people around a table and begin processing some theological perspectives, we're all going to raise the bar of understanding because we're benefited by one another's perspectives. That's one of the ideas that emerges out of the priesthood of all believers. And so the fact that we have people from all over the world who are thinking with us here and chiming in in the chat, we got somebody there, Helen from Melbourne, Australia, um, Mary Lou from Wisconsin. Hello, Mary Lou. And, and as people chime in together, um, we're just benefited by one another's fellowship. We're not, we're not called upon to receive uh, our understanding of God and truth from one mind as an authority source. We're called upon to, again, using the language that, that I prefer for this, to, to cross-pollinate. You know, one idea build, builds it. Uh, you're going to say something that's going to trigger something in my mind. And that's what's going to happen here with Elise and I. Elise and I have experienced this over and over again. Uh, we've been friends for a number of years and uh, we enjoy bantering. We enjoy one another's ideas flashing back and forth. Um, and it's just super fun to study the Bible with Elise. So Elise, thank you for being willing to do this uh, with us. And uh, welcome to the Arise Bible Study and the Three Angels Message series that we're moving through. Now, just one more brief comment before we launch right into the material so we set the table. For those of you who have been here, this, this is something you already know. For those of you who have just come on now for the first time, here's what you need to know. This is a Wednesday night Bible study that you can mark in your calendar, taking place the same time every Wednesday. And we have moved through various different topics. We did a series on obstacles to faith. And then we did a series on social justice in the thinking of Seventh-day Adventist pioneers. 
And now we have embarked upon a series on what is called the three angels messages. And here's what you need to know. For, for those of you who are studying the subject, the three angels messages are a series of three messages that occur in Revelation 14. Revelation 14 verses 6 through 12. Those three angels represent three messages that are given to the world through the people of God. So there's a sense in which, think about how cool this is. There's a sense in which right now we are actually living out in real time the prophecy of Revelation 14 by exploring, by studying this subject, by looking at it, by examining the three angels' messages, we're fulfilling the prophecy to some degree uh, by probing the subject matter and proclaiming it to one another. So we, we are a prophecy unfolding this very moment as we spend this time together. Now, we are moving systematically through all the ideas in the three angels' messages and we began with the everlasting gospel in session one from the everlasting gospel, which is the lens through which everything that follows is proclaimed. After we looked at the everlasting gospel, then we looked at the term, the, the words in verse six, fear God. So we spent time talking about what it means to fear God in the previous session. And now we have come to these words where Revelation 14 and verse 6 says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and tongue, which means language group and people. That's verse 6. Now verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God. And here's the part we're going to unpack and give glory to him. Fear God and give glory to him. Now, there's a bunch of stuff that follows that we will be exploring in, in detail later on. But right now, everybody that is tuned in, what we're seeking to understand is what is meant by this idea of glory in general, and specifically, what is meant by this idea that the first angel says, give glory to God, give, give him glory. Is, is God a narcissist? Uh, is God insecure? Does he need us to pet his ego? Is that, is that what's going on here? Or, or is something different taking place here? Does God need us to stand around and say nice things about him um, in order to affirm him? So, so with that premise and those questions, we're going to unpack what it means to give God glory. So Elise, um, that's a little bit of a, a background, a foundation, so everybody knows what part of scripture we're exploring. Um, Elise, what, what is meant by this idea of giving God glory? What, what, I mean, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? What do you, what do you make of this? Mm. I think, well, I'm just excited that we're talking about this because I think it's a great question and one that I've had um, when I've read this passage and also other passages is like, why does God ask us to give him glory? And um, I heard a sermon by you, Ty, uh, several years ago where you quoted Brad Pitt as someone who had this question who said, man, this idea that God asked for glory seems a little bit weird. Can Actually, can I read that quote? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, so Brad Pitt grew up in a conservative Baptist church, and um, he believed in God for a while, but he ended up rejecting God. And what he said was, I didn't understand this idea of a God who says, you have to say that I'm the best, and then I'll give you eternal happiness. If you won't, then you don't get it. It seemed to be about ego. I can't see God operating from ego, so it made no sense to me. Mm. And that statement by Brad Pitt um, reminds me actually of a Bible verse in Proverbs 25, 7. It says, it isn't good to eat too much honey. Um, someone needs to read that to Pooh Bear, who's always binging on honey. But the second part of the Bible verse says, nor is it glory to search out one's own glory. So there's actually a biblical principle here. Mm -hmm. It's not glorious 
um, to try for human beings to try to get glory. Um, and then that brings up the question, well, why is God trying to do it? And I think in order to- Elise, give everybody the text again for, okay, for the Okay, that was Proverbs 25, seven. It says, um, it is, nor is it glory to search out one's own glory. So mm. we have to ask ourselves, you know, is God asking us to, uh, is God not following his own instructions or mm. is there something about glory and what glory is that we're not understanding on a surface level? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing, one thing that's happening in, in the first angel's message is those who are doing the speaking, those who are saying, give God glory, are those who are proclaiming the message, not God himself. God isn't mm. saying, give me glory. Mm -hmm. There's a message being proclaimed by people represented or symbolized by an angel. And those people who are proclaiming the message are saying to their fellow human beings, give God glory. So they're pointing to God. Not It's not God pointing to himself. It's people pointing to God and saying, give God glory. Mm -hmm. And of course, elsewhere in the Bible, God does command people to praise him or, or give him glory. But I think it's really interesting to um, just to think about um, is our version of glory that we hear in popular culture, mm. what we think of the word, is that really, um, does that encompass everything that this is talking about? So when I, I did a Google search for the word glory in, in Google News, mm. so I wanted to see where does the word glory come up in Google News? And it's almost always like sports, um, musicians, yeah. cars, and it's usually re um, referring to something dominating or being the best. Um, so glory isn't really used very often in popular culture in terms of love and relationships. It's more about competition. Um, mm. But the word, the word glory used in here in verse seven in Revelation 14 is um, the Greek word is doxa. It's from dikeo. And, and what that literally means is um, what evokes a good opinion. So, yeah. so the root word here is talking about um, the judgment or opinion we have about something. And so I, I think what this is saying here is um, that God's people um, or, or God's messengers are calling the world um, to have an accurate opinion of God and to share an accurate opinion of God. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's so incredible. So so it it's basically a proclamation. The first angel is saying, you know, we're preaching the everlasting gospel and preaching the gospel has the effect of rendering an accurate depiction of who God is. Mm -hmm. So to give God glory is to formulate an accurate opinion of, of who God is, to tell the truth about who God is. Absolutely. And I think, you know, this is kind of the central question that is playing out in the war between good and evil is mm. who really is God? Is he good? Is he generous? Is he stingy? Is he withholding things from us? And, yeah. and as I was thinking through this today, I was thinking about Genesis 3. Um, when the serpent tempts the woman, he does it by challenging God's glory, really. He's, he's trying mm. to diminish her opinion. And, right. and really the temptation for Eve was to stop glorifying God in her thinking about God because the enemy knew that if he could diminish um, her sense of God's glory, then he could get her to operate in a way that was damaging yeah. to her. So there's right, this right. connection between our, our safety and security and our flourishing and our ability to see God as he is. So, so Elise, okay, everything has a context, right? So if we, if, you know, like, like there, there's a statement that has helped me over the years that I've said to myself, and that is when in doubt, pan out. Hmm. In other words, you know, we're looking at a line of text, give God glory. But if we pan out from there, we see there's a context in which it makes total sense. 
that we need to formulate an accurate opinion or perspective or picture of God's character. It makes total sense. Why? Because in the context of this Revelation 14 passage is the great controversy between good and evil that is brought to view in chapter 12 of Revelation. It says in verse 7 that war broke out in heaven. War broke out in heaven. The word war there is polemos, from which we get words like poles, like two poles on a battery or the North Pole, the South Pole. Polemic as in politics, as in opposing perspectives, opposing opinions. So an opinion war broke out in heaven, we could say. An opinion war broke out in heaven. A perspective war, an ideological war broke out in heaven. You know, they're not necessarily engaging in physical violence, although physical violence was may have been a part of, you know, what was taking place there to cast him and cast Lucifer and his his angels out of heaven. But but the real crux of the matter is that a perspective is being presented by this fallen angel, by Satan, a perspective, an opinion. And it's very interesting, Elise, because it says in verse seven, war broke out in heaven and Michael and his angels fought in this war ideologically. They fought by the comparison of perspectives, by the comparison of opinions. And the word Michael, the name Michael is a question who is like God? Or you could pose the question, like, what is God like? Mm. So, so from the very, the, the, the war is about, you know, what God is like. And then this, this same passage says in verse nine, that this, this one who's lodging this war against God is verse nine, the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. So there you have the context for, you know, fear God, reverence God with awe, stand before God in blown away amazement at who he is and give him glory, render an accurate picture of God's character, render an accurate opinion of who he is because the whole world is deceived. That's yeah. you know, chapter 12, verse nine. The devil deceives the whole world. So it makes sense, doesn't it? that the proclamation of the gospel is the, as, as somebody put in the chat, that, that it means, uh, Linda says, God is good, uh, and not, or somebody said the word vindicated, the vindication of God's character. I've lost it. Oh, it's Cassandra. Vindication of God's good character. That's how she's interpreting, you know, the glory idea. So there's there's the context of the idea, you know, that God is to be magnified because he's been diminished. God mm -hmm. is to be vindicated because he's been charged falsely. Mm -hmm. God is to be rendered accurately because he's been rendered inaccurately. So there's that's the war. That's the war. So we do battle in the great controversy by rightly rendering an accurate opinion of God. Absolutely. And I think... Um, there's just a really clear correlation between our ability to trust God and believe he's good and our ability to flourish as human beings, whether that's in our health, in our relationships, mm, mm. Um, really every domain of life, because we need to be in connection with his principles in order to flourish. And so, you know, we see that in Genesis 3, that once she allowed her view of God to be diminished, um, that's how so much suffering ent entered the world. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, story after story in the Bible, like you have the children of Israel had this problem with grumbling and complaining about God. Yeah. And God, you know, they were supposed to have daily praise and sing songs and, and they were instructed not to grumble. Um, mm -hmm. But that grumbling crippled their conception of God. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, so then you have, you know, they're on the brink of the promised land. And God is ready to give it to them. Mm. But so they send, you know, they send the scouts to look in the promised land. And some of them come back, all of this whining and complaining. There's there's humans of unusual size. There's giants. And we're yeah. not going to be able to get it. And that, in essence, was the opposite of glorifying God. 
um, because it was expressing doubt in God's ability. And mm -hmm. so that's what kept the children of Israel stuck for 40 more years. And so, you know, when God asks us to praise him, to glorify him, it isn't an arbitrary command. It's because he he's our he's like a loving parent that needs us to trust him if we're going to make it. Elise, what do you think of this idea? What do you think of this idea that that on a on a a scale of magnitude the more perfect or mature or loving or other centered a person a human being might be ego would diminish but consciousness of their love would increase so mm. if 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 you say so so is it possible that because god is utterly perfectly loving and therefore completely not egocentric that humility entails being conscious of who he is so god can say to you and me with no ego with no egocentricity at all god can say to you and me elise ty i love you perfectly and there's no ego in that Right. God is not on an ego trip when he says, I'm, you know, to put it quite bluntly, if God says I'm the best, it's true. <laughs> okay. and there's no ego involved whatsoever. He's simply stating he's saying, hey, Elise, hey, Ty, I love you perfectly and your best good is in acknowledging that reality and being in right relation to me by virtue of the fact that I am free of all egocentric concern. I love you so much that I can tell you that I'm perfect with no ego. Hmm. There's nothing wrong with me. And there's no, there, it's not egocentric when he said, now, if, now if I were to say I'm utterly perfect, if, if Elise were to say I'm utterly perfect, you know, if 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 you write a good book or a good article or you produce something or if I like I just have a new book that just came out. In fact, I just got home a uh, night before last and it was here in my office. And. You know, the human being can fall into an egocentric. You build a house, mm -hmm. you make a good meal. Man, that lasagna is amazing. Nobody makes lasagna like me. We're in danger of of falling in to attaching pride to our mm -hmm. accomplishments. Mm -hmm. But God is in no danger of attaching pride to his accomplishments because there is no there is nothing contrary to love in God's character. Mm. That's beautiful. I think it's so foreign to our minds that it's it's difficult to grasp. It is. But I I love thinking about it that way. And I I love thinking like, okay, if if you really want to help someone, like let's say you you see someone suffering, you know you can help them, you're a stranger to them. Like you have to build credibility mm. with that person. You yeah. have to get them to trust you if you're going to yeah. be able yeah. to help them. And God knows that as human beings, we believe what we say more than we believe what anyone else says as part of being yeah, self-centered yeah, human yeah. beings, right? Like I trust the words that come out of my mouth more than, you know, the words that come out of someone else's mouth. And there's this psychological, psychological phenomenon that our thoughts, not only do our words follow our thoughts, so we think a thought and then we say it, but our thoughts can follow our words. And so yeah, sometimes yeah. when I'm struggling in my life to to believe that I can accomplish something or mm -hmm. just with with thoughts that aren't helping, I yeah. will out loud speak what I know would be helpful to think. And I mm. think when God asks us to praise him, to give him glory, he knows that it will help our thoughts to follow our words. And so it's loving even even for him to ask us to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the chat, Elise, um, uh, Renee Martin and then uh, also Ross Wells 
are directing our attention to uh, Exodus 33 and verse 18. Renee says that in that passage, it, it says that that uh, that God showed Moses His glory, and it was goodness and mercy. It was mm -hmm. good. So, so we know we, we're familiar with that passage, right? Where where Moses ask the question, please show me your glory. And God says, yes, I will. He, he says, he answers in the affirmative. I will make all my goodness to pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And then a list of attributes are, are delineated, right? Mm -hmm. A God of truth, a God of mercy, a God of justice. God, so so what, what Renee and Ross are drawing our attention to is the, the kind of foundational definition of glory. So when we mm -hmm. read the word glory in scripture, that should trigger something in our minds. When we read the word glory, it shouldn't trigger the word ego. God's not on an ego trip. God is just, God is who God is. Well, who is God? God is good. God is merciful. God is just. God tells the truth. God is faithful. So the word glory equates to character. And here, here's a few Bible verses just to rattle off for those of you who are good note takers. Watch this, Elise. See what you think of this. Psalm 97, verse 6. The heavens declare God's righteousness and all the people see his glory. Mm. So righteousness is equivalent to glory. Psalm 115, verse 1, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name, we give glory because of your mercy and your truth. So in that passage, the glory of God is equivalent to mercy and truth. Isaiah 28, verse 5, in that day, the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. So in that passage, glory is equivalent to beauty. So, so over and over again in scripture, what, what, what Renee and Ross have, have, have pointed us toward is the idea that the word glory in scripture is equivalent to God's identity, hmm. right? God's character, righteousness, beauty, mercy, truth, justice, all of these things, all of these attributes collectively compose the identity of God, or we sometimes use the word character, the character of God. That's God's glory. Mm -hmm. God's, glory is, God's glory is equivalent to who God is. Barbara says uh, also the word grace is equivalent to glory. Barbara, I'm going to give you a text for that, um, the, which you probably already have, and that is John 1, 14. Um, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Mm -hmm. There's our word as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So Barbara, there you have a text that equates grace and glory as well as truth with glory. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think there's other, there's other passages that speak about like aesthetic beauty being glorious. Like there's a verse that says the glory of a woman is her hair. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's a passage that says it's a man's glory to overlook an offense. Um, so glory oh, can refer. Where to is a, that? It, it is in um, you have that? Proverbs, 19, the, Proverbs 19, Proverbs 19, I love that. Proverbs 19, 11, that it's the glory of a man to overlook an offense. Mm -hmm. Isn't that fascinating? Think mm -hmm. about that. Think and about I, that. Wow. That's amazing. It says, it says, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. To overlook an offense. So mercy, forgiveness, mm -hmm. is, is a manifestation of, of glory, the glory of God coming through a human being. I love how... Um, the word glory or glorious seems to be one of those, one of those words you use when other words are failing you. Um, like you're trying to describe, you know, oh, Yosemite National Park. It's, it's so beautiful. It's so epic. It's so, it's so, you know, and you can't think of another word that's better. And right. so, okay, it's 
glorious. And I think that's how it works with God is like, there's an aesthetic beauty about God that beauty comes out of him um, mm. in his creation, but he also is, is beautiful. And there's a character beauty about God. Um, yeah. And one thing I think is fascinating to go back to, to Exodus 33 and 34 is that when, when Moses asked, please show me your glory. Um, God said, God said, I will show you something, but there's also something that I'm not going to show you. Okay. okay so God okay. didn't just say, absolutely. I'll show you my glory. Here it is. He said, I will make my goodness pass before you, but you can't see my face. And so okay. in the story, he, he hides Moses in the rock. And I believe he, he showed Moses as much as he possibly could while still keeping Moses alive. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's this beautiful character description of, you know, the Lord, the Lord, God, merciful, gracious, um, abounding in mercy and truth. So part of God's glory are character attributes. And yet there was this part of God's glory that Moses couldn't see. And I used to read that and think like, I didn't like it because I thought, oh, I, I don't like the inaccessibility or it makes God seem far away. But mm. now I, I look at it differently and I think, um, the extent to which God is above us, mm. the, the extent to which we don't have access right now to something remarkable speaks to uh, just this transcendent, beautiful reality that we're going yeah, yeah. to, to yeah. be living in. Yeah, and yeah. The, the fact that it's so hard for us to, um, to see, we can't see God face to face, it means that heaven is going to be the most loving, beautiful um, experience mm -hmm. possible that like we can't even really wrap our minds around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fascinating. Everybody, did you catch that? Elise is calling our attention to the passage in Exodus 33 where, where God says, yes, I will show you my glory, my goodness, my name, my mercy, et cetera. But then God says, but there's something you can't see. So, so there's, there's a revelation, but there's also a withholding. But Elise pointed out that God says, essentially, I will show you as much as I can show you without destroying you. <laughs> that's very interesting. I mean, it, 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 that's, so that's explicit in the text in chapter 33, verse 20. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. You cannot see my face. I'll show you my glory to the degree that I can. I'll show you the attributes of my character. But Moses, if you see my face, you won't survive the ordeal. You won't be able, you, you, won't, you won't live. And yet, I don't know what you think about this, Elise. And yet in Revelation chapter 22 and verse four, it says we will see his face mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and his name will be in our forehead. Mm -hmm. So there's a point at which we can't see his face. And then there's another point at which we can see his face, which leads me to ask the question, well, what is it in the instance where we can't see his face and live? What's going on there versus when we can see his face and live? What's going on there? I mean, why can't we at one point, why can we at another point? Hmm. I think, I mean, the text that comes to mind right now is 2 Corinthians 3.18 um, that talks about like a transformation that occurs as we view God's glory. Um, let me look it up. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Okay, you can see if you think this applies or not. It says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think I think we could say, I think we could say that that the more like God we are in character, the more we can bear the full unveiled glory of his presence, 
the less like God we are in character, the less we can endure the unveiled, his unveiled glory. For example, you have these instances in scripture, like the one we just read in, in Exodus 33, no man can see the face of God and live. And then you have Isaiah chapter six, where Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And I, you know, I said, woe is me for I am undone. For I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So, so somehow when Isaiah encountered something of the Lord, obviously not the full unveiled glory of God, but when, when Isaiah saw something of the Lord, he became immediately hyper-conscious of his sin. And, and then the same phenomena with, phenomenon with Daniel, where Dan, in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel says that he encountered the Lord and he said, I became as a dead man because my comeliness was turned in me into corruption or my, my beauty, my opinion of myself was lowered when I saw some revelation uh, of glory, right? Mm. So all of us have been in the presence of somebody that we at least perceived or imagined was better than us. And that produces self-consciousness. You know, if somebody, if, 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 if I perceive somebody to be more intelligent or more articulate or more beautiful or more anything than me, just more than me, their more is going to magnify my less, you know, and God is the ultimate more. God is everything. And so there must be some kind of process by which through beholding and his glory and coming to know him, we're coming more and more into sync with him. A, a mm. symbiosis is occurring of character where, where when we see him, we don't see contrast. We see mm -hmm. him and we're glad mm -hmm. because there's harmony rather than contrast. What, maybe I don't know. That's a lot of words. But what, 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 so, what do you think of that idea? That that the reason we can't survive God's presence is because there's sin in us mm -hmm. that would come to the surface of our consciousness, and we would implode with guilt under the weight of our sin if we saw Him just as He is, by contrast to ourselves. Mm. Yeah, and and I think the good news is that you know Revel Revelation 14, in the context of this final judgment, what's happening here in this chapter is that um, the story is about to be over and God is going to seal his children. Mm. And, and you know, we know that we experience forgiveness through Jesus's death for us. We experience um, learning to grow more like Jesus as the Holy Spirit works in our lives. But mm. ultimately, you know, whether we, we die and, and raise again when Jesus comes or we're still alive when Jesus comes, there is this thing called glorification, uh, which I don't think that term is in the Bible, but that's kind of a, a term that was put on it. But the Bible says we will be changed. And so yeah. right now we're caught in this struggle of like, we love God, but yet it's hard. And sometimes we love other people and we don't. And part of the good news of the gospel is that we're not gonna have that internal struggle indefinitely that eventually, um, it's going to be natural and easy mm. to love. And at yeah. that point, we're ready to see God face to face. Yeah, well, that, th yeah, that reminds me of, okay, so, so in, in, in Romans 3, sin is defined as coming short of God's glory. Right? Mm -hmm. Romans 3, 23. So all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, so, so is that why we can't encounter the full unveiled glory of God is because our sin comes short of his glory. It comes short of who he is. So, so we would see in ourselves things like right now, in this moment, right now, the reason why you and I and all these people can have a coherent, you know, pleasant interaction 
to some degree is because we are we are propped up by by opinions of ourselves that are inaccurate. Mm -hmm. like, like like if right now I was perfectly conscious of everything in myself just as it is as God sees it, I'd I'd be on the floor in tears. I would I wouldn't be sitting here all composed, you know, having a Bible study. I would be I would be devastated if I saw myself just as I am, as God sees me. So there's a sense in which there's a sense in which God is allowing us to move through a developmental process, a growth process of of becoming a becoming process, becoming more and more like Him. I'm thinking of of First John chapter three, behold, what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and it does not yet. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Mm. So we're going to be something else than we mm -hmm. are now, but we're in the, we're in the becoming process it is not yet revealed what we shall be, but this is interesting. But we know that when he is revealed, we will be like him. Mm -hmm. So we're in, we're in a process of growth and development. We sometimes call it sanctification, right? We're, and that, that whole thing is brought out, I think, in Romans chapter 5, where justification and sanctification, in a sense, are both, both brought to view. Romans, okay. Well, Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? So there's our mm -hmm. word glory. But watch this, everybody. That's Romans 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then in chapter 5, when Paul is explaining the gospel, the plan of salvation, he says that having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also... Also, also in addition to what, Paul? In addition to being justified, in addition to having peace mm -hmm. with God, mm -hmm. right? In addition to being justified and having peace with God, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So, so in chapter 3, verse 23, to sin is to come short of God's glory. In chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, okay, you've come short of God's glory, but here's the gospel. You can be justified and brought to peace before God. Hmm. But also, also, now that you're justified, now that you're at peace with God, also, now you stand and rejoice in hope. Of the glory of God. What does he mean by that? Well, in chapter 8, he tells us, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So we're justified. And then the whole posture after we're justified, now that I'm at peace with God, my whole posture is one of leaning in to God's glory to partake of it. To, to, to Paul says, I have access to it. I have access to God's glory and God's grace so that I become more and more like him until finally the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that will actually be revealed in us. We will be carriers of the glory of God. Uh, we will be like, like what is it? Earth, Paul says, earthen vessels or jars of clay that bear the glory of God. Hmm. And I, I love that. I love how um, I love thinking about the glory of God from an art perspective. So, you know, shortly in in Revelation 14, um, after it says, give glory to him for the hour of judgment has come and worship him who made the heavens and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And so there's this connection between glory, worship, uh, glorifying God, worshiping him and mm. the fact that he is the creator of all things. And um from my own experience, like I um, recovered from a really bad eating disorder. So if I was gonna view that through a lens of glory, 
I would say, mm-hmm. well, God made me and created me. And I wasn't glorifying him because there's something in my life and my experience that is bringing damage and destruction to his creation. Um, mm. But thankfully, God um, broke through to me and and connected me with really loving people and healing resources. And I got better. Mm. That is glory to God. Like, I think it's Irania said, the glory of God is man fully alive. And so as part of creation, when we make decisions for our physical health, for our, like the Bible says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Decisions for our physical health, decisions for our relational health, decisions just to learn and grow and and tackle big goals. All of those things um, bring glory to God because they beautify his creation. And I think that's, I think that can be like an adventure um, if we think of ourselves as part of uh, his art and we're trying to, we're trying to be the best art that we can be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi, Allie. Hey guys. So can I add one more thing, Allie, before we do Mm -hmm. the Q and A? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Here's the one more, here's the one more thing. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to compare two scriptures, Elise, and see what you think of this. Okay, so everything we've talked about with the first angel's message, give God glory. We've we've focused on the aspect of that declaration that magnifies the beauty and goodness and righteousness and justice and mercy of God's character as what's being proclaimed to the world, right? But embedded within the gospel is a negation of of illegitimate human glory in the context of the Mm -hmm. gospel Mm -hmm. so listen listen to this text in ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 in comparison to the first angel's message which is the everlasting everlasting gospel and involves saying give glory to god okay watch this for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, mm. lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I was reminded of that because you said the, the idea of art, the, 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 the comparison of art. Okay, so in that text, the word boast is translated in some versions as glory. Mm-hmm. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should glory. Mm -hmm. Lest anyone should boast in himself, in herself, right? For we are his workmanship. We are his poema, is the Greek word. We are his work of art. We are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So that text seems to be saying, and, and therefore the first angel's message seems to be, The first angel's message seems to be a deliberate pushback on meritorious salvation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a direct, it it seems to be a direct um, negation of salvation by works. The -hmm. first angel's message is saying, everlasting gospel, give God glory for your salvation. Boast in him. You are saved by grace through faith in him. All the good stuff in your life is is his art. It's you're a masterpiece. Everything, all the poema in you is his poema. Glorify him for your salvation, not yourself. So the first angel's message in that sense seems to be an undoing of the salvation by works system. Do you think that's true? Or is that, uh, am I, is that too much to compare those two scriptures? No, I I think that's beautiful. I think that that also is the biggest relational favor that God can do for us because pride brings isolation and spiritual pride brings isolation because it disconnects Mm. me from God when I'm focused on myself. And it also disconnects me from other people because it's really hard to forgive people, to get along with people if you, if you feel superior to them. And so again, you see this call to um, glorify God as being something that helps human beings flourish. Mm. Yeah. 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 
So the first angel's message, when it says, give God glory, it, it's essentially saying, render an accurate opinion or perspective or picture of God's character. In, in modern vernacular, we might say, um, you know, fear God and make his character famous. Mm. Make God famous. Make God famous. Magnify him. Draw attention to him. Not, not mm. to you, not to to, you know, a church or religion, draw all the attention to him. Look at him. Make God famous. I like it. Okay, Allie, do we have questions? We do. I like it too. These are, this is really great, guys. Um, we do have a few questions. So the first one is from Jim. Hi, Jim. And Hi, Jim. Jim asks, he says, were we created to give God glory or to or to the glory of God? Sorry, I feel like I read that. Were we created to give God glory or were we created to the glory of God? Yes. <laughs> I like that answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> Can I throw some scripture at it? Please, Please do. Isaiah 43 verses 6 and 7, Jim. You're going to love this text. This is right up your alley because of your question. I know you're going to love this, Jim. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. So what's the nuance of Jim's question? Were we, or are we to... Were we created to give God glory or were we created to the glory of the Lord? Both, Jim, both. We were cre According to this passage, we were created for God's glory, which you might say it this way. We were created as conduits or channels or mediums through which the character of God would freely flow. Mm -hmm. Like we're receiving in and it's going out. We're receiving in and it's going out. We're receiving in and it's going out. So we were created to receive from God, the beauty and goodness of his character and to shine out, to, to reveal the character of God. But that is much, much different from like, uh, Serena Williams and her sister, the, t the tennis people, um, their dad decided to have children because he wanted them to play tennis, right? So it was like, I mean, not wow. that he loved his children. That, that... It was like, I need tennis players. And oh my goodness, when wow. We, that's when nice, we say, I guess. Oh, you wonder why they're so good. Well, that's why. Um, <laughs> right. When we say we were created for God's glory, it can almost, um, I don't know, it sounds like God is using us. And, oh, and that's okay. not the case because God is so good that his glory includes um, the fact that he won't be happy until we're happy uh, and he's working for our happiness. And so it's a very different um, distinction. I think, you know, mm. there has been really bad theology like um, Calvin was very, very into the, the doctrine of glory, the glory of God, but that was always married with, you know, God created some people to be saved and some people to be lost and it's all for the glory of God and anything that happens is for the, the glory of God. But you, you can't separate God's glory from his love. In, fa in fact, scripture says that explicitly. Um, this is very interesting. So here, here are, I, I think these are powerful passages about the glory of God along the lines of what you just said. So Jesus comes into the world by the incarnation. As he's born of Mary in Bethlehem, the sky is filled with angels who look at the event of the incarnation and say, glory to God in the highest. Mm -hmm. So the highest manifestation of the glory of God is God coming down, not God staying up, mm -hmm. God coming down, mm -hmm. God coming down in humility, clothed in our flesh. The angels look at that. All they've ever known is God high and lifted up, God enthroned, right? Right. God comes down and they say, oh, now that's the highest manifestation of glory we've ever seen. Hmm. When God came all the way down, now it was very, very high in their estimation. And then in um, 
John 12, verses 23 through 28, Jesus answered and said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And he's referring to the cross. Mm. So when Jesus dies on the cross, we have a manifestation of the glory of God that is of the highest order. So God coming down and being crucified, according to scripture, is the glorification of God at the highest possible magnitude. And then in John 17, verse 24, Father, I desire that they also, <clears throat> whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. He's going to be crucified and he's going to go to be with the Father. And he's saying, Father, I, I want them to be here where I'm going to go with you momentarily after I'm crucified, um, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me mm -hmm. before the foundation of the world. So in that text, the love that exists between the Father and the Son, Jesus says, constitutes their glory. Mm -hmm. The glory of God is the love that exists between them. And the cross and the incarnation reveal that going down, going mm -hmm. down kind of glory. And and that's the same idea in Philippians 2, that Jesus um, didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So he didn't count his former glory as something to, to hang on to. Instead, mm -hmm. he emptied himself and became like a, ser a servant. And then it says, therefore... God has highly exalted him. So he got yeah, his yeah. glory by giving his glory away. And it's such a um, such a testament to human value yeah, yeah, yeah. that Jesus would be glorified by sacrificing for us. Patty summarizes everything <laughs> in a single sentence. Patty says, the glory of God is the love of God. Mm, thanks, Amen, Patty. Patty. <laughs> We said all this stuff and Patty just summarized the whole thing in a single, <laughs> single sentence. And then Renee says, love is everything in God's kingdom. Love is everything in God's kingdom. Hmm. Beautiful. All right. I love that, guys. Okay. Next question. This is from Bernie. And Bernie asks, how can I give glory to God when I'm an unclean vessel? How can I give what I don't already have? Am I not just returning glory to him that he gave me first, like love in 1 John 4, 19? I, Do you want me to read who, it again? Who, who, who's, who's that? This is Bernie. Hey, Bernie. I think what you just stated there, Bernie, is is accurate. I, I like that. I think, I, I think that that's what we were trying to get at, get at a moment ago when when we said that we receive from the Lord and, and then we give out. So we're, we're like a conduit or a channel or a medium through which, but it's really important, Bernie, to maintain agency, free moral agency in that equation. So God isn't simply glorifying himself through an inanimate in channel or a, a, lifeless channel you're you're bernie you're a living person you have thoughts and feelings and you can do things and not do things right you can say yes and no so there's a great deal of agency is the word that we use sometimes there's a great deal of free moral agency so yes it is ultimately god's glory not simply moving through us to him as though he's glorifying himself but God's glory is being revealed to us and it's reconfigured mm -hmm. in my individual personhood. And then I make a, a unique free moral agency display of God's glory of my own free will. So it's not just a loop. It's, it's more like a machine, right? It's a mechanism. God's glory comes in, it's reconfigured according to my experience and perception. That's why, you know, a thousand, a million different people, tens of millions, hundreds of billions of people can all have something to say about God 
that is both the same and different. It's the same in the general sense that everybody who's speaking an accurate opinion of God is saying, God is good, God is beautiful. But my rendering of the beauty of God and your rendering of the beauty of God are two different finger paintings because of the uniqueness of each person's individuality. Yeah. Ross is chiming in for Bernie. And Ross Wells says to Bernie, uh, Bernie, when a child replicates the goodness and integrity that they witness in their father, their father's heart is overwhelmed with love and adoration. I, that's really good, Ross. He's essentially saying that God can actually derive pleasure from us loving him. I have this amazing book. I'm going to show you guys if I can grab it really easily here. This is one of my favorite theologians. His name is John Peckham. And um, you're probably seeing it backwards, <laughs> the title backwards. Are you guys seeing it backwards? Yeah, we see it. It's good. Okay. So this, this book is called The Love of God. It's a little heady because it's a, it's a theological book. But man, if you could spend a year working through this book, you would be blessed. Because in this book, he, he essentially blows out of the water the idea that everything that is happening within the divine human relationship is static and controlled by God. And he points out that a human being can actually make God happy. Hmm. A human being. And that's what Ross is basically saying. R Ross is basically saying that it's possible for a human being to say something or do something to which God would respond with, with adoration, to which God would respond with praise, to which God would respond with elation, to which God would look upon and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I like that. You know, uh, God can render a, a positive opinion of his child who is loving God and others well. Hmm. I love that. All right. I think we have time for about one more question. Um, this one is from Barbara. And Hi, Barbara. Barbara asks, how do you get past the fear of misrepresenting God. If giving God, I think what she's meaning for context, yeah, giving God glory is showing his character, making him famous. How do you get past the fear of misrepresenting him? Well, what do you think, Elise? Um, I think it's a, it's a growth experience, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, not, and I think, I think we're called to be storytellers. Um, to share with someone how God is improving your life, how a principle in the Bible is helping you. Um, you can't really go wrong with that. And so it's not so much of, can I give the per perfect presentation about God, um, but is my kindness towards others and my life communicating that, um, that God is love? And yeah, I think we will get it wrong, you know? I mean, that's part of what that's part of what keeps us coming back to Jesus is that we're yes we're trying to share his love with others but sometimes that's mm -hmm. not what we do and um and yet we keep trying and failing and keep going I was on a, I was on a hike last week on a kind of a gnarly trail uh with my girls with my daughters and um there were like roots and rocks and all kinds of stuff and my daughter Leah is known to be clumsy. Um, last year, she drove her motorcycle. We were all riding motorcycles that we rented, and she drove the motorcycle into a parked car. Um, <laughs> I could tell you story after story after story of Leah. Leah is notorious uh, in our family and among her friends for walking and turning around because there's a thing in our family that is true of every single person. None of us can talk to anybody without looking at their face. So, so even if we're doing, we're walking, Leah has to turn around if someone's saying something and she inevitably is, she's not, she's not sure-footed. And so Leah on this, this trail, we were walking and her foot caught a rock or a, a root or something. 
and she was going to topple. She, she, she tripped over something and her immediate impulse was to reach for me. So rather than falling away, she was falling toward because she perceived in me, you know, quite mundanely a physical body that could, you know, keep her from falling. But she also perceived in me the safety of, of her father that would also, I found myself as she tripped, she was, her impulse was to fall toward and reach toward me. And my immediate impulse was to reach toward and grab her to keep her from falling. Mm. That's the dynamic. Um, who asked that question? Um, this is Barbara. Barbara, that's the dynamic. You know, you will make mistakes, but make your mistakes in the general direction of Jesus. So, so when you, when you blow it, when you fail, when you fall, fall toward the light, fall, fall, fall toward Jesus. Um, and just what that means in theological terms is that, you know, you're asking, how can I get over, how can I overcome the fear of misrepresenting God? Well, by doing your very best as his daughter to rightly represent him. And when you perceive in your conscience that you have failed or come short of his glory, fall toward him with repentance. Oh, I'm sorry, Jesus. I'm sorry, Father. I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean to have that attitude. I didn't mean to project that, that tone. I didn't mean to be like that. And, and guess what, Barbara? You don't need to grovel even a second longer because you are immediately just forgiven, clean slate, innocent. You just, you just fall toward the light. You get up and you run forward with your stubbed toe. I love that. Elise, do you have anything to add? God loves you, Barbara. <laughs> and everybody else. But differently, he doesn't love you all the same because you're different people. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I think we're just about out of time. Ty, Elise, thank you. I think everybody's really, really enjoyed this. I've enjoyed it. It's been a blessing, a huge blessing. Mm. All right. All kinds of good comments. Diego's like, prodigal son. <laughs> yeah. Donald says, thank you, Ty and Elise. All right. Well, we will talk to you guys later. Bye, Elise. Bye, Ty. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again. We are so grateful that we're able to do this every week. It's really such a blessing. Just a few things before we go. Some of you were asking about Ty's book. His new book that he just came out with is The Heavenly Trio, and that will be available for order tomorrow evening at the Lightbearers website. You can go to lightbearers.org to find The Heavenly Trio. And then again, this has been recorded, so you can find this part, you can watch the replay and all the previous parts at lightbearers.org slash live. And then just scroll down and you'll find all the previous parts to this series, and you'll also find all the other series as well. And then lastly, um, we are again having the study every Wednesday. If this is your first time, I think Bernie said it was his first time. We're really glad that you're here. And so we'd love for you to join us again next week. This Bible study happens every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So you can click the button at the bottom middle of your screen to register for next week's study. That's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Thanks, guys, so much for joining us. We'll see you next week. Bye, everybody.